Can you hear me now? Okay. All right, so today we are going to talk about a very difficult topic, which is continuous state, continuous action MDPs. Well, let me just write general MDP because you could be continuous, you could be discrete, you could be finite. And the idea in general MDP is exactly the same as it was for the finite MDP, it's just that the state space and action spaces could be any set. So, so S can be subset of Rn. A can be subset of Rn or S can be subset of space of natural numbers or the space of uh, integers or A could be the space of natural numbers or integers and so on. Okay, so this is just general state space setting. We have a cost from S cross A to R. Well, not R actually. Let me make it 0 infinity. So you want the cost to be bounded from below. So you, I'm just using 0 as the lower bound. You can put any lower bound you want as long as it's finite. <clears throat> the third thing is the transition kernel is now a measure, a probability measure over the state space. So this is a, a conditional measure. Okay, so ds prime is, uh, it's just the integration thing that you write. So this is the conditional, this is the transition kernel and it's a conditional measure over s prime given s comma a. Okay. Now much of the Success in reinforcement learning over the past 10 years has been on solving MDPs of this type, okay? So in robotics, your state space is usually the position and velocity and ang angles of various joints. So those are all real numbers. Your actions are usually uh, some sort of acceleration or braking action at various joints and that's your uh, that's your action A, which again takes values in Rn. Or in some cases, you could have a continuous state system, but you have a finite number of actions or a countable number of actions, okay? So those are also situations that are encountered, for instance, in portfolio management, where S is uh, the current portfolio invested in N mutual funds or N stock options and A is uh, how do you want to divide it in certain chunks, okay? So how you want to divide the portfolio among a given set of stocks or set of mutual funds. Um, you are given a cost function, of course, which is, uh, S, which is a function from S comma A to zero infinity, so all we need is bounded from below so I'm just putting zero there because zero is a good bound from below. And if your C is bounded from below by say minus five, then you add five to the cost function and that becomes your new cost function that you're trying to optimize. So adding a constant to a cost function doesn't really matter because your solution is going to be the same. The values will shift, but the solution, the optimal policy is going to be the same. This is the transition kernel. And then of course you have your cost function j mu which is expected value. So j mu of x, oh, maybe s0, which is summation t equals 0 to infinity 
alpha raised to t c of s t a t given s zero is uh, s zero is s and a t is a function of mu s t. This is the expected cost function. Expected discounted cost. And naturally, alpha is less than one here. And we are interested in the optimal policy. So we want to compute mu star, that is argument of mu from s to a of j mu j mu of x yeah OK. Now, before we jump on to Markov decision problems with continuous state and continuous action spaces, I have to talk a little bit about what are measurable functions, OK? Because measurable functions forms, uh, it, it becomes a very complicated affair to do the dynamic, to run the dynamic programming over continuous state space setting uh, without talking about the measurability issues that could arise. So I understand that many of you may not have taken real analysis, and therefore you don't have adequate background to understand measurable functions from the correct mathematical way. So what I'm going to do is give you a very uh, brief introduction to measurable functions, which is not entirely correct, but it can get you there. It can get you close to the actual mathematical theory uh, when, if and when you take uh, measure theory class in your grad studies. OK, so I'm going to start the discussion on measurable functions with continuous functions. OK, so we all know continuous functions. So continuous functions are something that looks like this. So it is continuous. So fx equal to x square. It's a continuous function. x raised to n is a continuous function. Cos x is a continuous function. OK, these are all continuous functions. And of course, everyone knows what continuous functions are. Uh, then we have continuous, sorry, uh, almost continuous functions. So now I'm going to draw a continuous function, and I'm going to add certain jumps to the function at some certain number of points. OK? So this is my x. This is my fx. OK? So in the almost continuous functions, you're allowed to have certain number of discontinuities. OK? Uh, in general, you can have infinitely many discontinuities. So let's say you have discontinuity at every integer. OK, so your function jumps at every integer. So something like a staircase function. So this is a staircase function. And it has jump at every integer. It jumps up by 1. And this is also an almost continuous function because 
except for the values at integers, the function is continuous everywhere, right? So that's what I mean by almost continuous functions. And so almost continuous functions are the mathematically correct way of calling almost continuous functions is measurable functions. Okay, so measurable functions are almost continuous functions, so they are continuous pretty much everywhere except for a certain number of points. And that certain number could be countable, infinity, right? So at countable number of points, you can, your function can have a jump, but rest of the, uh, over the rest of the space, it is not going to have any jumps, it's going to look like a very nice continuous function. Okay, so those are known as measurable functions. Next, I want to introduce continuous and bounded functions. So what are the examples of almost continuous functions? Well, this is the staircase function. In your controls class, you must have studied the step function if you have taken a controls class before. So a step function is a function that is zero when x is less than or equal to zero and it jumps up to one when x is greater than or equal to zero. So fx equal to zero in x less than zero, fx equal to one when x is greater than or equal to zero. So this is the step function. And that's also a almost continuous function and it's actually a measurable function. Now the good thing is you add an infinite number of measurable function, it still remains measurable. Okay, so you can add 500 step functions, it will still remain measurable function. The third, Definition is continuous and bounded functions. So this requires not just continuity, but also boundedness. So fx equal to x raised to n is unbounded on r. Okay, so it goes to either plus infinity or minus infinity. So it's not a bounded function. But fx equals to 10 raised to 100 cos x is a bounded function. Of course, the bound is really large. It's uh, 10 raised to 100, but it's still bounded. It's not infinity. So I'm going to use CBX, CBX set of all continuous and bounded functions. This is the notation we will be adopting for the rest of the semester. Any questions so far? Okay, yeah. Can you give an example of non uh, measurable function? <laughs> <laughs> That's a very good question, but unfortunately, I can't because it's a. Uh, <laughs> There are two classes in measure theory that is dedicated to constructing a non-measurable function. It's very hard, yeah. Is, well, there's a famous example from Dirichlet about something yes. related to that. Is that one of the functions that satisfies that? I don't know whether it's Dirichlet or someone else, but yes, there is a construction of non-measurable function, okay. which takes quite a bit of effort, yeah. <laughs> uh, 
you know, I know the construction, but I don't want to spend time on it. Uh, it's just a lot of time that will go into constructing one such function. Okay. So uh, one thing you should know is that almost any function you will see in reality is going to be a measurable function. It's not going to be a non-measurable function. Um, the fourth I, thing I want to introduce is measurable and bounded functions. So I'm going to use L, B, X. Have we used L before, L? I don't think so, okay. So L, B, X is space of, set of all measurable and bounded function. So staircase function is not a bounded function. So staircase does not belong to LBX or LBR, I should say. However, step belongs to LBR. Okay. Any questions? Okay. So if you think about the space of all functions, which now you should start thinking about, because we are going to talk about function spaces for a long time. So this is my LBX, and this is my CBX. So CBX is a very small subset of the set of all measurable functions. Okay, set of measurable functions is extremely large, and the set of uh, bounded functions is very, very small subset of this extremely large set. Okay, and if you use a neural network, it's a continuous and bounded function, and it's perhaps just a very small subset of the set LBX, which is the set of all measurable functions. Okay, now we can start making sense of the dynamic programming algorithm for continuous state, continuous action MDPs. So let's try and introduce the Bellman operator for this class of problems. Yeah. So the ReLU function for a neural net wouldn't be bounded. Why are we saying all neural, net, all neural nets must be bounded? Well, uh, so you don't want your, so in, in applications you don't want your neural networks for, to give you unbounded outputs, right? So your weights are going to be bounded, your inputs are going to be bounded between let's say zero to one or zero to 500 or zero to one million. Mm -hmm. So the output is always going to be bounded, okay. yes. right? So typically in applications, your S would be a compact set. It won't be an unbounded set. Okay. So the Bellman operator is defined as T V of S, which is min A in capital A C 
CSA plus alpha integral Vs prime P ds prime given SA. This is integration over S. And this is my Bellman operator. Uh, we'll cover it in some time. Okay. Yes. Domain of the functions. Of the Not the range. The range is always R. A function f is from x to R. Yeah. Okay. Now there is, there is one small change that we need to make to this model that we have been studying. When you look at the state and when you look at the action, not all actions would be available at all values of state. Okay, so let's think about it. If you are driving a car, at small velocities you have certain choices of acceleration and deceleration that you can take. At larger velocities there is there are some other choices of acceleration and deceleration you can take. Okay, so you can't really accelerate very fast when you have uh, when you are stationary on the ground. So your 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 wheels will start spinning at the same space, same place, um, and it, they'll be slipping at the at the point where wheel touches the surface. Okay, so those accelerations are not possible. So very high accelerations are not possible at that particular uh, point of time. So for low velocities, there are certain accelerations that are possible. At high velocities, there are some other accelerations that are possible. At one point of time, your engine will saturate, and you cannot accelerate at all. So when your velocity is 150 miles per hour, which I hope nobody has driven at that velocity. But if your velocity is 150 miles per hour, then your car is, has reached its maximum limit, and there is no further acceleration that it can do. Okay. So in those situations, what you want to do is you want to restrict your actions to be uh, the set of all actions that are possible at that particular state. So A of S is the set of actions, set of permissible actions at state S. So Bellman operator features a small change where you do the minima you perform the minimization only over permissible actions, not at over all possible actions. Okay, even when you are flying and the aircraft is on the runway, you will notice that the pilot increases the thrust of the engine very slowly. Okay, and that's also because of the limit set by the manufacturer of the engine. And the, those engines cannot accelerate or decelerate at will. They have to be accelerated in a very specific fashion. Uh, otherwise, the engine will burn out. You know, burn out in the sense that it won't provide enough thrust. There will be a lot of turbulence within the engine. And so that's why um, it's not possible to pick any action at all states. Okay? So there are only some certain permissible actions, and you, you have to be within those limits. Okay. Now the problem is, when you have countable number of actions or you have a continuum of actions, so whether A is in Rn or A is, is, is N or Z, then this minimization, even if you have a continuous function here of S and A, the minimization may not be well defined. Okay. So let's uh, look at an example. So let's say S is my N, A is N, and I want to minimize S e raised to A minus A. And I want to inf over A in A.
what would the infimum be? What would the infimum be here? So A is N, so I can take E raised to minus N here, so I can take N going to infinity, so infimum is actually going to be zero for any value of state S you want. Okay. So in the finite action setting, you had only finite number of options here and you can always take the minimum, that's not a problem. When you have infinite action setting, the minimum may or may not be defined. You may have infimum, but you may not have minimum. More importantly, it is unclear when you do the minimization over an infinite set, it's unclear whether the resulting function is going to be measurable or not. Okay? So because of those technical reasons, we have to put a bit more structure on the cost function and on the conditional measure in order to make sure that this is well defined, the Bellman operator is well defined. So we need to add more structure to the problem. So let's try and add those structures so that the Bellman operator will be well defined. Remember that in dynamic programming, we use Bellman operator iteratively. So that's why we need to make sure that this entire operator makes perfect sense. So I'm going to define a set K. This is the set of state action pairs such that S is in S and A is in A of S. So this is a subset of S cross A. So set, set of all permissible state action pairs. Okay. I'm going to write all the conditions on this side. So now the cost function C would be a function of k to 0 to infinity. Because the cost is not defined for non-permissible actions. OK. What do you think should the structure be put on the cost function and the transition kernel to make it work. You can come up with easy examples, yeah. Focus function should be bounded. Bounded, okay. Okay, that's a good point, yeah. I was going to start with uh, making both of them convex. Convex, well, you know, the convexity is not defined on n or z, so. If it's in r. If it's in r, then you can make it convex, okay. Any other suggestion? How about just letting it be continuous? Okay, so cost should be continuous. So we want the first assumption C from K to zero infinity is continuous. There are more general conditions available, but I don't want to go into them. The second is a growth condition on C. Which is as follows. It's known as inf compact C, which is basically for every compact set Trying to make sure that I don't screw up the definition of inf compact. Okay. 
Okay. For every S in capital S, R in real line, A in AS such that C of S comma A is less than equal to R is compact. When will this condition be automatically satisfied? Under what conditions would this condition be automatically satisfied? Any thoughts? A is finite, right? So if A is finite, then this condition would be automatically satisfied because finite sets are always compact, okay? And that's why we didn't have this condition when we were studying finite state space MDPs. Similarly, every cost function on a discrete space is continuous, so we didn't have to make this assumption for finite state space MDPs, but now we need to make these assumptions, okay? So this is basically saying that your cost for, so if, you're, if you take a large action, then your cost should go to infinity. That's what the meaning of this particular assumption is. This, is. this looks very technical, but what it actually means is, pick a cost that is outside the compact set, your cost is going to be pretty high. Shouldn't that be if there exists an R for the bound, not for all R? No, this is for all R. For all R. So it doesn't matter how large R you pick. This has to be compact. Okay, let's uh, consider a counter example. So C of, so A is N and C of S comma A is one over A. Okay, so if you take a very large action, your cost is actually very small. Okay, so, so that's a situation which uh, doesn't satisfy the inf compactness condition and therefore you may not have a solution here. Okay. So those are the two conditions that we make on the cost function C. Um, so continuity and some sort of growth condition. Now we need to think about cost function on the transition probability in order to make things work, okay? So let's think about it. We want this particular integral to produce a function that has similar properties as C of S A, right? And C of S A has what property? Well, it is supposed to be a continuous function. So we would like, sorry. So, so um, if you have to make sure that uh, uh, for this to hold, uh, the action space has to be compact, right? No, so if action space is compact, this would automatically hold as long as C is continuous, which we have it by well, assumption. It's not no, it's not necessary. Okay, okay. Let's let's look at a non-compact situation. So, S equals to A equals to R, and C S A equals to A minus S square. So this is usual uh, tracking control and control systems, right? So, or it could be S square plus A square. <clears throat> okay, so for every S, this particular set is going to be compact. Okay? If it is vector A transpose Q A, so A is a vector and Q is a positive definite matrix, so not positive semi-definite, positive definite matrix, then also this condition would be satisfied, okay? All right, so what we want to have is, we want to make sure that no matter what V I pick, I want this particular integral to make a lot of sense for me. 
I want this integral to be continuous because we have assumed continuity of C. So let's make that, let's uh, define it formally. So we say that P is weakly continuous. So this is the definition. B is in CB S implies integral of V of S prime P S prime given S A is in P of D S prime given S A. This is in CB of K. That's definition number one. Definition number two is P is strongly continuous. V is an LBS implies integral of Vs prime P Ds prime given SA is in CBK. Okay. Now, this condition is definitely weaker because you are picking a V from continuous and bounded function. You are getting an output which is a continuous and bounded function after the integral. Uh, in this situation, you are inputting a measurable and bounded function and you are getting a continuous and bounded function. So the probability transition kernel here has to have much stronger property in order to lead to a continuous and bounded function. So typically, this would be the case if your S prime was some function of S comma A plus a noise term W, which has a continuous distribution. So I want to write it formally. So two is the situation where, let me write it here. So S prime, equals to f comma s a. Have I used f before? I have not. Okay. So s prime is f s comma a plus some noise w where f is continuous and w is and pdf of w is continuous. So W is Gaussian or um, exponential random variable or something like that, so that it has a very uh, smooth distribution. Then in that case, this condition would be satisfied. P would be strongly continuous, okay? Usually this model is very common in uh, control systems where you have additive noise on your state space. So your state is, say, the velocity and the wind is adding certain forces on your vehicle, which is leading to a change in velocity, depending on the current state and action.
ओके एनी क्वेश्चन सो फार Okay, so these are the three assumptions I'm going to make on the model. And where should I? Uh, yeah. So for discrete problems, it's not true that. Uh, so in discrete problem, everything is all functions are continuous. So even measurable functions are continuous. So therefore, in discrete spaces, all of these. conditions are trivially satisfied so in discrete okay so you are talking about discrete space so let's say s and a both of them were discrete variables so it but it could still have a uh, infinite number of variables in it so for instance s could be the space of natural numbers so this is trivially satisfied because because every function on a discrete space is continuous this is not satisfied because you want this to be finite in a discrete space a compact set is always finite so therefore this condition is not automatically satisfied so you need to check for this but this is again trivially satisfied because any function is always any function on discrete space is by default continuous oh but you need to make sure it is bounded but it will be bounded because v is bounded so i guess it's fine yeah okay So in discrete spaces 2 is the only condition you need to check 1 and 3 is sort of trivially satisfied so you don't have to worry about it Okay So now under those assumptions I can apply the Bellman operator again and again without any problem Okay and I will converge to some fixed point of the Bellman operator let me write that formally from the space of value functions to the space of value functions uh which i have not introduced but v is the space of all functions v from s to r so t has many fixed points one of which is the optimal solution optimal value function okay so if uh, v star so basically if u is the fixed point v bar if p v bar equals to v bar then v bar is greater than equal to v star so v star is essentially the minimal element in the set of all fixed points v star is minimal again these are some things that will not happen if you had finite state space but it happens when you have continuous state space No, V bar is not optimal at all. Okay. Yeah, V bar is not optimal at all. Uh, and uh, basically, V star would be the minimal element, so it would be the minimum of all possible V bars. So it will be basically, if you look at the 
all the functions on the state space S. So this is v bar 1, this is v bar 2, this is v bar 3, and your v star will be the minimal element in the entire set of fixed points. So it will be below all other functions. Yeah. So then without adding more constraints onto the problem, can you say anything about uh, how T constructs has a space is where given different starting conditions yes. converge to the different V bars? Perfect. So V star, that's the second part. V star is T infinity zero. So if you start from zero value, zero initial value function, and you keep iterating the Bellman operator, you will reach V star. <coughs> zero is the zero function. Z zero function. Uh, no, so this T has multiple fixed point in the space of value functions, okay? But T infinity zero will converse to the minimal element among all those fixed points. Remember, V star is minimal, right? So T infinity zero will reach that minimal element uh, of the set of fixed points. Again, this, this is something you did not see or you did not observe in the case of finite state, finite action MDP, but it is true in continuous state, continuous action MDPs. Okay, so why is zero? The problem is if I start from a non-zero value function, okay, so remember you have proved it before, T has a monotonicity uh, assumption, so no, not assumption. So T satisfies a monotonicity condition. So if you want to prove that you will converse to V star starting from an initial point here, that initial point has to be below V star. So you can pick a value function that's something like this. So this could be your V0. But how do you know uh, how to construct such a V0 which is below V star if you don't know what V star is, right? So you know that zero is definitely below V star. That part is clear. But anything above zero, I'm not very sure whether I'm below V star or not, okay? So if V star was a quadratic function, so if V star was a quadratic function like this, and you pick the value function which is non-zero, constant but non-zero, it's not guaranteed that you will converse to this fixed point. You may or you may not. We just don't know. You cannot prove it. That's the problem. Sorry? Why V star has to be positive? Uh, yeah, so V star has to be non-negative, not positive. Um, it has to be non-negative because my cost function is non-negative. C is k from zero to infinity, right? Okay, so another question. V star should have signs at the point equation, like yes. V star equal V star. Yes. So does it mean V star is equal to zero here? No, this is not. Sorry, at infinity? At infinity should, the fixed point should be rigid, right? The fixed, the fixed point should be satisfied, so. Yes, yes. So this is, okay. So V star equals to T infinity zero equals to T, T infinity zero, which is equal to T V star. Right, so it satisfies the fixed point equation. Yeah. When you say it has many fixed points, does that mean when you're starting with a different value function, you go to one? Yes, you go to one fixed point, but it may not be the minimal fixed point. Okay, so uh, if you have a neural network approximating the value function and you start from some random neural network initialization, you will converse to some random fixed point of T, which need not be the minimal fixed point of T. Okay. Yeah. Any way of discussing how fragile that 
construction condition is for if we add more structure, we can and yes, so, that yes, so I'm now going to add more structure. Okay. So these are one, two, three conditions. Uh, one condition that I have not said, there has to be a policy mu which leads to a finite cost. Okay, so that's, uh, that's obvious. If you have all policies that give you infinite cost, then there is nothing to minimize. Okay, so now I want to add more structure to the cost function to conclude that T will have a unique fixed point. Yeah. So does that make this instead of a discount MVP, it's stochastic choice path that we should be able to get rid of alpha or alpha should be able to be one? Where? In because you're saying if there's a policy that, that means there must be finite cost. Right. Uh, then that's isn't that the same as saying there must be a no. state that accumulates no more cost, which was the requirements for No, no. So remember that this is this is discounting with respect to alpha, right? So you can so you can pick a sequence of actions that gets you to very high state setting. Mm -hmm. um, as long as the cost at that particular state multiplied by alpha raised to t is sufficiently small. Um, I know it, 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 you have to think about it a little bit to make sure that if you are in a in a non-compact setting, non-compact state setting, you could have a policy that blows up these states, that blows up in the state space, right? So as you move through the Markov chain, you are basically escaping to infinity. But that escape has to be at a sufficiently slow pace so that you, it leads to a finite cost. Of course, you never want to go to infinity, so you always want to come back. So in queuing systems, for instance, you want to make sure that your control policy, which is how you are routing the packet or how you are um, uh, doing things, uh, it should lead to a minimal delay or minimal cost. And if there is, there is no control policy which can do that, then you have to change the system itself. There's nothing you can do about it. Okay. So now I'm going to add 4a, assumption 4a, where c infinity is bounded. So c is bounded. Uh, c is bounded. So if your cost is bounded, which was the case in finite state space setting, uh, T from CBX, CBK endowed with the infinity norm to CBK in, endowed with the infinity norm is contraction. Then you can apply fixed point theorem and Banach fixed point theorem and you can conclude that no matter what starting condition you start with, you will always converge to the optimal solution. And it has a unique fixed point in the space CBK. <clears throat> okay. For B, okay, so let's go back to the finite state space, finite action setting. So this was satisfied, this was satisfied, this was satisfied. And this was satisfied, and this was the conclusion we had made about the Bellman operator, okay? So, in some sense, we were using all these four conditions, but we never actually realized that we are using those four conditions in the case of finite state space MDP. But when you have infinite state space, then you have to be a bit more careful. Okay, 4B, I'm going to make the following assumption. 
phi of s comma a. So there exists a function w. There exists w from s to r and m in r and k less than 1 over alpha 0 such that have we used k before? No, we have not used k, so that's fine. C of s comma a is less than equal to m w s, so that's 1. Integral of w s prime p ds prime given s a is less than equal to k w s. Okay, so you are allowed to pick, in this situation, you are allowed to pick any function w as long as it satisfies these two conditions. So of course w has to be a function that is finite everywhere, so it can go to infinity, so w could be s square, but it should be finite at every point in the state space. So you can pick any w uh, from s to r as long as it satisfies these two conditions. So the first thing is the cost has to be upper bounded by ws multiplied by some constant term. Uh, I don't particularly care about what this constant is. But the second constant k has to be less than 1 over alpha. And I want my integral of ws prime with respect to the transition kernel to be less than or equal to k multiplied by ws. Okay, where this k is strictly less than 1 over alpha. Now under this much stronger condition, which I don't know when it will be satisfied, but under this much stronger condition, you can show that t is a contraction, but you need to define the norm first. So we are going to use the W sup norm, the weighted sup norm. Oh, I, I guess I have screwed up. This should be LB. Sorry, can you make a change? This should be LB, not CB. weighted SOAP norm and this would be on the space LB. And then T LBS with weighted SOAP norm. So LBS with weighted SOAP norm is a contraction. Four B. So in both these conditions, you will have a should it be bounded? Well, 
the norm has to be bounded, but the function itself need not be bounded. So b itself need not be bounded as long as the norm is bounded. So this b essentially refers to having a bounded norm. So lb of s is the space of b such that norm of b is less than infinity. So v need not v itself need not be bounded, but the norm of it has to be bounded. Okay. So in both these situations, when 4a and 4b are satisfied, in addition to 1, 2, 3, we conclude that the contraction of the Bellman operator t will have a unique fixed point, and no matter from where you start your value iteration, you will converge to that particular fixed point. infinity norm over a, a you could yeah is there something about two that makes that so infinity norm over a let's think about it can you make it infinity norm over a probably yeah and then you can pick m to be 1 Perhaps, yeah, I think that should work. You just have to check this particular condition. That, I think, is not that obvious because of the parameter k, which has to be less than 1 over alpha. Alpha is the contraction coefficient right here, uh, the, the discount parameter. Under essentially the same conditions, you can also show that policy iteration converges. Okay, so so this is of course uh, iterated application of Bellman operator is value iteration, and then the policy iteration requires a policy evaluation and then policy improvement, right? So the actor critic method, and even that converges under 4a and 4b conditions. Yeah, so the policy, so the, num the number of times you have to run policy iteration has to be finite. So which means that your improvement will not happen after a finite number of steps. Only then you will say that the policy iteration converges. Otherwise, yes, yes. So I'm not saying it is feasible, yeah. but uh, using function approximation and using some sort of simulation device you can at least get an approximation of the policy iteration, if not the true policy iteration. Do we have some sort of uh, theory supporting that when we simulate this using finite precision, yes. it will converge to the optimal result within some accuracy bound? Because that seems not optimal. Yes, theory. absolutely. You, that's a very important question. So if you use so you are in an infinite state space setting. So your S has infinite values, your A has infinite values. And then you start using 500 samples to run your reinforcement learning algorithm. Is there any guarantee that you will actually converse to any solution that is in the vicinity of the optimal solution? So the answer to that is there are some guarantees. I don't know how good they are. OK? So. So, so the, there are guarantees, and those things guarantee, those bounds are extremely loose. However, in practice, it seems to work well. So I don't quite know how to connect those bounds with, um, with reality. OK, so the gap is pretty large. <clears throat> OK. Now one thing you will notice is we talked about the space of measurable functions, which is extremely large. We talked about the space of continuous functions that is extremely small in that space of measurable functions. And what I'm noting here is that t is a contraction from the space of measurable functions to the space of measurable functions, okay? 
let's look at the assumptions that we are making. So we are making assumption that C is continuous. We are making the assumption that P is strongly continuous. Okay. So even if I have a measurable value function here, this whole integral is continuous because P is strongly continuous. This particular function is continuous because I've assumed C to be continuous. Once I take the minimum over a continuous function, there is no guarantee that this term is going to be continuous. So this TV is not going to be a, it may not be a continuous function, right? So, so I start with a continuous function, I take the minimum, I get a discontinuous function. And that's not, is there a problem with that? Is there a problem with that? Correct. Yeah. So, so every time in, in this particular situation, you have a continuous function. But when you get here, you have a discontinuous, you may have discontinuous function. Right? Is that, does that create a problem in reinforcement learning? I'm sure you have all read a little bit about reinforcement learning. So I want to get a sense of whether it, it's a problem about in reinforcement learning or not. So we all use deep reinforcement learning or we all use some sort of kernel approximation, all of which are very smooth continuous functions, right? So I am going to, so I, I am in the big space. I am in the measurable space. This is my continuous functions. These are my functions spanned by neural networks. And and I have my V star, which is in the space of measurable function. Or I am constantly, when I'm running the value iteration, my V0, V1, V2, V3, and so on, they are all in the space of measurable functions. So it, it, it feels a little bit problematic that we are trying to approximate a measurable function with a continuous function. Right? Especially if it is if it is coming from a parametric class. Yeah. They do, yeah, they do, but they are basically dense in the space of continuous functions. So but but that's the neural network with all depths and all breadth. Right? So you're not going to have all depths, you'll probably cut it off at maybe twenty <coughs> layers or fifteen layers or something. That's why I'm showing it as a small bit. You will have a finite parameterization of neural network. Okay. So, so this is a problem. So how do I how do we get around the problem? Well, one idea is to have a bit more structure on this on these things so that the minimum fits out a continuous function. So that way, we always remain within the continuous class. So no matter where we start, we are always within the class of continuous function. Yeah. No. No, we are going to we are going to strengthen the condition here okay in order to ensure that the minimum is always going to be a continuous okay so this is achieved through what is known as birds maximum theorem Since I don't have much time, <clears throat> okay, so I'm 
taking this stuff from my favorite analysis book, Ali Prantis and Border, page 556. In order to define the Bird's Maximum Theorem, I need to define correspondence. Uh, should I do it in full generality? What do you want? Do you want the full generality or do you just want a special case? You know, let me just do a special case because I don't think I can go into the full generality. So let's say my S and A is R and my action is bounded in this particular fashion to some monotonic continuous function. So H1, H2 are increasing. continuous functions and of course uh, C is continuous Q is, sorry P is strongly continuous then T V is continuous. Of course, we naturally want H1 to be less than or equal to H2, otherwise this will not make any sense. Okay. So if this, these conditions are satisfied, then this particular thing is going to be continuous because C is continuous, P is strongly continuous, therefore this is continuous. This is continuous, you take the minimum with respect to A in AS and the AS is given by these uh, set of inequalities. So your acceleration is bounded from above by some function of state and bounded from below by some function of state. And these functions are increasing continuous functions. Um, I think you can also do it for decreasing continuous functions as well. So H1 and H2 can be decreasing continuous functions. Then in that case, T of V is going to be continuous as well. Okay. So in this situation, the cool thing is, you start from the space of continuous functions and you remain within the space of continuous functions throughout the process. So you don't go out of it, you don't step out of that particular bound. Okay. So in those situations, I'm more comfortable using neural networks to approximate the continuous function because I know that neural networks are um, continuous functions and they span at least they are dense in the space of all continuous functions. So if I use a sufficient depth neural network, then I know that I can be as close to the continuous function as possible, uh, as close to the value function as possible throughout the uh, value iteration phase. The general version of, of that maximum theorem, of how strong of a condition is it to prove for it's very complicated. Okay. Yeah, I was planning to introduce that complicated theorem, but I don't have time. So, so you need to understand what is known as correspondences for the general maximum theorem. Has anyone stumbled across this term correspondence before? No. Okay, then <laughs> I'll leave it. Uh, 
Sorry, if this for A is positive, positive. This theorem doesn't hold anymore, right? Which one? The maximum right. theorem? Yes. Why? Because S and A, A space must have must be in like must be the all real uh, real values, right? No, no, no. It, it could be a positive real line too, as long as these conditions are satisfied. Okay, so just yeah. Like basically, uh, basically, what I have done is I have sat down from two o'clock to three thirty today, and I have tried to prove this statement by proving that it satisfies all the conditions for Bird's maximum theorem. Okay, so I had to come up with a simple example for the class. Okay, now what do you do in reinforcement learning? In reinforcement learning, there are two approximations that you make. One is you approximate the value function using some sort of function approximator, and then you approximate the policy using some other sort of function approximator. Okay? So what we are going to do in the next two classes in, in the week after the break is we are going to talk about universal function approximators. So those are function approximating classes that span the whole of CVX or the whole of LBX. Okay, so we'll, uh, or maybe some special subclasses of LBX. And we are going to talk about universal function approximators for two classes, and then after that, we'll talk about various strategies for computing TV. Because as someone rightly pointed out, you have to do it for every value of the state S in the state space, and the state space contains infinitely many values, so how are you going to do it? So that's one problem we are going to talk, talk about. And the second thing we are going to talk about is how do you do this minimization, or if at all you have to do the minimization at every point of time or not. So we'll talk about those important issues after the function approximation theorem.